Shabbat Shalom, everybody. God bless you, and thank you so very, very much for joining us this morning for our Father's Seventh Day Sabbath. And thank you for keeping our Father's Seventh Day Sabbath, a day that he said would be a sign between him and his people, a perpetual agreement for all generations forever. Once again, everybody, I'm Pastor Scott Villain with Holy Impact Ministries, and uh, it is Passover weekend, and we are just uh, absolutely ecstatic about being able to bring this particular study to you. Uh, we have many studies on uh, the Passover. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different study that we're going to have uh, on the Passover today. Uh, this particular study is geared towards uh, getting our brothers and sisters out there who have been shunned away, led astray from the Passover to come back to the Passover. My friends, no Passover, no salvation. It's just that simple. No Passover, no salvation. You have no Passover lamb, you have no salvation. You have no redemption. You have no hope, my friends. Again, uh, this is monumental, and this is why our Father in Heaven commands His people, His children, to keep this Passover forever and throughout our generations. We're going to be talking about a lot of things that stop a lot of Christians from uh, coming back to and observing the Passover as God has commanded them to do. And so that's what this is going to be geared to. If you are part of this assembly, I want you to scoot your chair up closer to your computer. If you're in the chat room today, I want you to unload in the chat room all the scripture that you can to reinforce what it is that we are preaching and teaching today. This is a team effort today. Uh, we have a lot of people, that uh, new people, that are probably going to be stopping by. They're going to be interested, dipping their toes in the water, if you will. Uh, may have some atheists, may have some agnostics, may have some lost Christians who have no clue uh, about the Passover and how monumentally important it is to keep it in remembrance. Uh, so, uh, I need your help. I, I want to say this. Uh, I had well over 40 some different pages uh, of, of scripture, most of which I kept, but not all because of time constraints. And so this is why I'm calling on our assembly to fill the chat room with reinforcing scripture uh, that uh, we'll be talking about today, because uh, many scripture I had to cut out, I didn't have time, which might help you to understand that this is going to be a little bit more lengthy of a study here today, uh, but it will be a very enlightening study, I promise you, and uh, some things that you may not have thought about before. Uh, if you've been with this assembly, uh, you already know a lot about the Passover. Uh, I have faith in our assembly. Uh, as I say, our assembly uh, is not like most assemblies who just come and sit in our pew warmers uh, and listen to some guy preaching behind a pulpit. Uh, they actually get involved. They actually study their Bible. They actually know what the Bible says. They will argue with you if you get it wrong. Uh, they will challenge you. Uh, and so uh, I love our assembly, and I, and I love uh, the fact that everybody's in their Bible, everybody's studying. We've got some tremendously powerful people uh, within our assembly here at Holy Impact Ministries. And uh, that's what we teach, Bible. Uh, we don't teach anything else. It's just Bible. Uh, we are not bound by any denominational empire of men or, or anything else. Uh, we teach Bible. God says. That's it. That's all. And so if that's what you're interested in, if that's what you want to know more about, you're in the right place here uh, this morning. Before we get started, uh, I would like to ask for prayer for our beloved brother, Tim, uh, who, as far as I know, uh, is, is home resting, has been to two different hospitals now, has not had anything solid to eat for over a month. Uh, and uh, Sister Rosemary uh, has uh, told me that uh, he needs to be able to eat something solid. We need to pray for him. Uh, nobody seems to be able to, f to understand what's wrong with Brother Tim or fix him. Uh, uh, again, my friends, uh, this is something that we need to pray about. We know who the great physician is, and I want to ask you personally, please, 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 this Passover weekend, ask for a Passover miracle. 
a Passover miracle that would heal Brother Tim and get him back on his feet. Brother Tim has been with this ministry for many, many years. He is a godly man. He knows the Bible inside and out as well. He is a reader and a studier of the Word who tests everything. We need him in this assembly. We need him on his feet, and we need his voice, and we pray that Yahovah God would keep him with us for a, a longer period of time. We need him. Please, my friends, pray for Brother Tim and pray for the assembly. Pray that everyone that is within the assembly that is not feeling well, that all of these different things that are going around, uh, some of them we hear about, some of them we don't hear about. Some people are a little backward about asking for prayer. Pray for the assembly. Pray for the assembly, my friends, that everyone is doing well and everyone is on their feet. We need everyone uh, armed, putting on the full armor of God and getting into the fight. And uh, today is going to be more evidence of that and how we can be the light of the world, the salt of the earth that we need to be. So pray, my friends, pray this this weekend. Uh, this is a very powerful weekend. And Yahovah God's ears will be open and his eyes will be watching this weekend. Very powerful. Okay, so uh, what is what is the Passover? For those of you who may not know, the Passover represents the redemptive innocent blood of God's Passover lamb. And how that innocent blood that was put upon the doorposts of the house of Israel caused the angel of death to pass over them back in the days of Moses. That same innocent redemptive blood that was shed Thousands of years later, by the Lamb of God, who God had raised up from among the brothers of the house of Israel to be a prophet likened unto Moses, that would eventually, once again, lead God's people out of every nation and every corner of the world and bring us back into the promised land of milk and honey that Yehovah God had long ago promised his faithful servant Abraham, my friends. That's what the Passover is all about. It proclaims the remembrance of God working through his prophet Moses to save his people and to bring his people out of, uh, of bondage, the bondage of sin and degradation. My friends, Egypt was sinful beyond measure. The Pharaoh of Egypt is, was a shadow picture of evil and the dragon, the serpent, the devil himself. And so it's important that we understand they worshipped everything in Egypt, everything that moved. If you do a study on Egypt, you'll find out that they worshipped frogs, they worshipped bulls, they worshipped cows, anything that moved, they worshipped. Not to mention the fact that they also had idols that they carved and all kinds of things. And uh, it was much like uh, it was in the days of our Messiah when he was here. Uh, they had all kinds of different idols, all kinds of different gods. And uh, it, it, the Greeks were absolutely infamous for just in, in the Romans as well, worshiping anything and everything that moved. Uh, they even had, as you, as Paul tells us, an unknown God. This is this is a for the unknown God. Paul says, "This is whom I speak to you, the the God that you don't know, <laughs> right?" And they were making homages to this God that they 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 didn't know, right? Uh, so again, this was an evil and despotic empire. Egypt was, and uh, Yahuwah God sent Moses his faithful servant, to go in there. And it was through Moses and Aaron that he pulled and extracted his people out from under that evil and that bondage. And uh, what actually broke the back of the Pharaoh was, again, Yehovah God bringing death to the firstborn man and beast of Egypt. That's finally what broke the back of, of the Pharaoh. Now, uh, again, throughout all of these plagues that came down, all of these plagues that he rained down upon Egypt, the house of Israel was safe. The house of Israel that lived in Goshen, which was a small portion of Egypt, was fine. Even during the plagues, they, they had no hail, they had no problems. Uh, they could see even in, in the darkness, uh, 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 which was another one of the plagues. Uh, everything that God did, he protected his people from. He told them that before he brought this angel of death upon them, that they were to take an innocent, unblemished male lamb, and that they were to slaughter that lamb and put the blood of that lamb on the doorposts 
and the lentil of their homes, so that death would not come to them. The angel of death would pass over those who had the blood of the lamb over their heads. Again, my friends, Christians today don't get it. They've been taught a bunch of garbage and trash and filth that has absolutely nothing to do with God's Passover that he commands us to keep forever and throughout our generations. And we're going to talk a little bit about this. We're going to get into this. If you're on the fence about the, the Passover, stay with me. You won't be by the end of this study. And we're going to give you a plethora of Scripture that you can stand on as the bedrock of your foundation. And so, uh, once again, my friends, uh, this is very powerful. My friends, there's a reason why God commands his people to keep his Passover in remembrance year after year, forever and throughout our generations. There's a reason for each and every one of his feast days and his appointments. It is written that our Father in heaven teaches us the end from the beginning. Therefore, those who know nothing of the beginning know nothing of the end. It is written that there is nothing new under the sun. What will be has already been once again pointing to the fact that our Father in heaven gives us glimpses and shadow pictures of things to come. Just as it is written, God does nothing without first sharing his secrets with his servants, the prophets. Today, we're going to break down some walls that have long ago shamefully been erected in order to hedge God's people away from God instead of bringing them back to God, which was Yeshua, Jesus in the Greeks, original mission in general. Today, we're going to explain in great detail not only the importance of being obedient to God and not to men who teach against God, but we're going to show you what the devil, the serpent, the dragon has done in order to hide the fact that where there is no Passover, there is no salvation. Stay with us. We'll be right back after the break. And we'll begin. Welcome back, everybody. God bless you. Thank you for staying with us. And again, once again, just as you have just seen in that script, uh, God has a name. It's not Lord. And uh, it has been covered up in our Bibles. And we need to know and we need to understand. Did you, did you know that God wrote his name over 6,519 times in your Bible? 
Did you know that? He most certainly did. And again, I'd like us to go very quickly before we get started here, because we're going to, uh, a lot of times when you see the word Lord uh, in the Bible, uh, you will hear me say Yahovah instead of Lord. Why is that? Well, because they have covered up the name of God with the word Lord in the Bible. Let me show you that. Uh, because before we get started here, I don't want anybody to say, why do you keep saying Yahovah? Are you a Jehovah's Witness or something? No, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. Far from it, my friends. No, sir, I'm not. Uh, but let me show you why I say, yeah, now not Jehovah, because there was no J sound within the Hebrew language back in then. It was Yahovah. Uh, let's go. I just want to just, before we get started, I just want to play off that script that we just showed you, that slide work that we just showed you. Uh, let me take you over here to Exodus chapter 3, verse 15. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, now again, that's a wrong word that doesn't belong there. We're going to show you what that word, that Hebrew word is in just a moment. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Okay, so what's the name? There's no name here. It just says Lord. There are many lords in the Bible. There are many gods in the Bible. Uh, so what is this? Well, very clearly, uh, all we have to do, if we want to know, and we today can do that with the click of a mouse. We go to King James numbered version of the Bible. We click on this the word Lord. It is H3068. Let's double click that. Let's bring over our dictionary here. We're going to go to Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew definitions. And as you can see here on the screen, it is Yahovah, the proper name of the one true God. Okay, so where you see the word Lord capitalized in the Old Testament, now this is not always the case in the New Testament, but it is all throughout the, the Law of Moses, the writings of the prophets, and the Psalms. When that word is capitalized, and even sometimes when it's not, it'll say God, and it, it is actually God's name as well. Over 6,519 times God wrote his name in your Bible. Did you know that? If you didn't know it, you know it today. Okay? So this is why, and I wanted to just make sure that everybody understands uh, why it is that as I'm going through this study this morning, I will not be saying, Lord, I will be saying Yahovah, the name of God, where God has put his name. My friends, God signs his signature with every commandment that he ever gives all throughout the Bible. Everywhere that you see that word, Lord, and open up your Bible, I challenge you, open up your Bible and look and see how many times you see, Lord, 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 6,000 times, and today's Christian does not know it. You know, it's a funny thing, uh, I think it was last year, the Pope of Rome said he was going to come out and, and divulge the name of God, and I laughed. You are going to divulge the name of God. God has told us his name. It's in our Bible. We just have to study it. Again, my friends, uh, the, the King James numbered version of the Bible is always the Bible that we go back because it's numbered. We can go back and we can see what those original Greek and Hebrew words were. Uh, that's called asking, seeking, and knocking, by the way, which we all ought to be doing. Uh, and so uh, this is just part and parcel of, of what we're going to get into today and how it is that the devil, the dragon, the serpent has indeed fooled, if possible, even the very elect. And so my objective this morning is to explain in some detail why a Christian cannot have salvation without God's Passover. No Passover, no salvation. The truth of the matter is that the very reason that Yahovah God instituted and ordained his Passover is so that we in the last days would understand the power and the glory of God and his redemptive plan to bring mankind back from the brink of destruction. Do you know that our Father in heaven planned right down to the hour when our Messiah and King would be crucified upon the cross thousands of years before it happened? From the day the exodus took place and God instituted and ordained that all households would take a lamb and slaughter that lamb and eat their Passover meals at twilight, God knew that his Passover lamb, who is Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek, would also be slaughtered at that very hour. 
And so it was. And that's an immovable and unarguable biblical fact. And many other such things God has done in order to show us his wisdom and his power and his glory. The problem is that the devil has been hard at work for generations, doing all that he can do to hide these things from God's people. By dressing himself up as an angel of light, and oftentimes hiding himself in the most obvious of places, i.e. behind the pulpits of many modern-day churches, the devil has thought to change the times and the law of God, just as Daniel long ago prophesied that the beast of false religion would indeed do in Daniel chapter 7. No Passover, no salvation, is not some kind of man-made-up mantra or some new cliché or some kind of newfound catchphrase, my friends. No, pow no Passover, no salvation is what our God-breathed scripture teaches and exemplifies and most modern-day Christians today are completely and utterly blindsided when it comes to understanding that biblical fact. Before we ever even get started this morning, I want to once again start off with a few scripture that need to be kept in mind as we journey through the Bible here this morning. And therefore, I'd like to begin with John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Let's start there. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24 says this, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Does it say, why doesn't it say physical? When true worshipers will worship the Father in the, in the physical and the truth. Why doesn't it say that? Because the spirit, my friends, is what controls the physical. The Spirit controls the flesh. The hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in both spirit, and what was the other one that they will worship in? Truth! What is truth? According to Yeshua, according to the apostles, according to the prophets, God's word that our Messiah became in the flesh is truth. Not man's word. God's word is truth. Let's read that again. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers, get that, my friends, the true worshipers. In other words, there will be false worshipers. We're going to read about those false worshipers. We're going to point out those false worshipers. We know who they are. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must, must, not should, not could, might, not might, must worship him in spirit. Get that, my friend, spirit and truth. It is written in John chapter 4 that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in both spirit and and in truth, and the only way that we can worship him in both spirit and in truth is to understand one of the most important fundamental commandments of our time, of mankind's time. Let's go take a look at that as well. Very important commandment that I want us to all remember as we're moving through this study here this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 4, 2, you shall not add to the word that I command you. My friends, if you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, please Please, my friends, this is monumental. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahovah. There's his name, his signature again. That you may keep the commandments of Yahovah, your God, that I command you. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. Not haphazardly, but be careful to do. You shall not add to it, and you shall not take from it. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. 
Do you suppose that the church today has in any way, shape, or form added to God's Word or taken away from God's Word? That's the question that I want you to ask yourself as we are moving through these scriptures this morning. Hold that thought. Many modern-day Christians in our time who do not read the beginning of the book have no idea of the fact that the house of Israel back in the days of Moses did not just contain Israelites who were born by blood into the flesh and blood lineage of Abraham. There is this uh, supernatural thought process that goes through the brain of of a Christian today who thinks that the house of Israel was only made up of the 12 tribes of Israel and and nothing else. Because that's what they're taught. Shamefully, shamefully taught, my friends. And this is why many Christians today separate themselves from the house of Israel. Many Christians even think that they are above the house of Israel. We're here today, my friends, to stomp that and to throw that demonic doctrine of demons to the ground. The house of Israel, back in the days of Moses, was a mixed multitude of people from all walks of life, including, but not limited to, the Egyptians themselves, who followed the Israelites when they left the bondage of Egypt. These people saw the power of the Elohim of Israel and what he had done to Egypt. And this mixed multitude that was within Egypt willfully and intentionally chose to follow along with the Israelites as they left Egypt and to be grafted into the house of Israel so that they too could be seen in the eyes of God as natives of the land. Let's read about that biblical fact so that we can know that what, that what we are doing here is standing on solid ground here this morning. We can find that information in Exodus chapter 12, verses 38 through 51. Let's go read. Again, opening the books this morning to the book of Exodus. Exodus. And we are going to go uh, Exodus uh, chapter 12. And we're going to read uh, down here 38, and I just want to read 38 through 51. It says this, and please highlight this in your Bible. Uh, Exodus chapter 12, 38. A mixed multitude also went up with them. Now, what is Exodus chapter 12 all about? Exodus chapter 12 is all about the very first Passover. The very first Passover is here in Exodus. Okay? In fact, here in in the beginning of Exodus, I just want to bounce up here, just take a a quick detour here. I want to read this to you. It says, Yahovah, there's that name again, said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. So all of this, number one, Uh, it's important that we understand that the month that we are in right now is God's first month of the year. God's first month of the year, New Year's Day, was March 11th, my friends. A new moon was hanging dark in the sky. We saw that the evening of Sunday, uh, March 10th, uh, Monday, uh, or Sunday, Monday, March 11th, was the first day of God's new year. 2024 is officially here according to God's Bible. Again, God's God's, uh, times and his law have been completely changed by the uh, beast that Daniel told us would change the times and the law of God. Okay, So all of this is about the very first Passover. Okay, let's get back to where where we were. I'm going to just scoot down here. And again, Exodus chapter 12, verse 38, a mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And they baked unleavened cakes. Now, unleavened, leavened is yeast, for those of you who do not know. They baked uh, cakes that did not have leaven in them. So, leaven causes cakes to rise, right? 
so they didn't have time to let the, them rise. So they baked unleavened, unyeasted, if you will, cakes of dough that they had brought out of Egypt. For it was not leavened, didn't have any yeast in it, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. The time that the people uh, of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of Yahuwah went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by Yahuwah. My friends, please highlight this. Exodus chapter 12, verse 42. It was a night of what? Watching. My friends, is God watching on his Passover? Yes. Yes. It was a night of watching by Yahuwah to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to Yahovah by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. My friends, does it say just till my son comes? No. Does it say just till I send my prophet likened unto Moses? No. Does it say until I send the man that I was going to raise up from among the brothers of Israel that I promised in Deuteronomy chapter 8? No. It says throughout their generation. The people of Israel. Who are the people of Israel? Well, let's read. Let's continue. And Yahuwah said to Moses and Aaron, this is a statute of the Passover. Now listen to this. No foreigner shall eat of it. But every slave that is bought for money may eat it after you have circumcised him. I want to stop here for just a moment because I want us to understand the importance of circumcision. What is circumcision? What is the importance of being circumcised for a man? Again, my friends, circumcision is a circle. Why is it a circle? It's a covenant between God and man. When a man has a child, the seed of the man passes through that covenant of, of circumcision, that covenant of God, and therefore... When his children are born, all his children are born holy, which means they belong to God. Otherwise, your children are not holy. They don't belong to God. You haven't passed through that covenant of Abraham. Okay, so this is a big deal, this idea of circumcision. And again, circumcision is a very painful thing for a man. It's not something that a man forgets doing. Uh, again, my friends, this is something that every time uh, a, a man looks down, he knows that the covenant of Abraham is upon him and through his seed that will pass through him. Okay, So circumcision, a big deal. That's another whole study that we have uh, over at our website at holyimpactministries.com. Uh, again, we have lots of uh, uh, studies on that. We won't get into that right now. Let me go back. And so Yahuwah said to Aaron, to Moses and Aaron, this is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. Was God blessing the slaves? Yes. Yes, he absolutely was. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. Now, what was a slave? I just want to touch on this. What was a slave back in the days of the Israelites? Again, my friends, we read about Hosea. We read about Gomer, right? Hosea was a prostitute. God said to Hosea, marry this prostitute, have children by her. God wanted Hosea to realize the pain and the suffering that God himself was suffering with the children of Israel. He was their husband. The house of Israel was to be as his wife. It was metaphorically speaking. And he wanted Hosea to marry this prostitute, Gomer. Where did Gomer wind up? On the dust of the ground, being ready to be sold as a slave. Now, what did, what did that mean to be sold as a slave? Well, back then, if you had no money and you had nothing to offer anyone, of course, Gomer's beauty as a prostitute, disappeared. And so when that beauty disappeared with all of these men that she had been with, she had nothing. Nobody wanted to give her jewels and gold and, 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 and money anymore. So Hosea found her sitting in the dust of the earth, being ready to be sold. And this is when Hosea comes and he purchases her back and brings her back. Again, phenomenal story, 
a lot of shadow pictures, a lot of metaphorical understanding uh, within uh, the story of Hosea. If you have never read the book of Hosea, my friends, uh, you want to understand the pain and the suffering that God has gone through uh, trying to keep the house of Israel uh, it, safe and secure. Uh, you need to go read the book of Hosea. And so being a slave uh, was not about beating people and doing, oh, you know, we think about slavery and we think about uh, the the slavery that man knows about, right? It wasn't about that. It was about you could buy someone, you could pay so so much money for someone, and then you would take them in and help them get on their feet. And then in so many years, you were to give them part of your flock, part of, of what they have worked towards, and they could get on their own feet. And it was a way of lifting people up, people who were destitute, people who had nothing. There were no homeless people in the house of Israel. If you were homeless, you could, be, you could say, hey, I want to be a slave. I want to be this person's slave. You do what they tell you to do. You work. Uh, you would earn as you worked. And then you could get back on your feet and you were introduced back into society. That's what slavery was back in the days of uh, the Israelites. A little different than, than what we think. I just want to make that clear uh, as we continue on. So, even the slaves, God was blessing. He says, you get them circumcised, then they can have my Passover. But he says, no foreigner that's not circumcised is not allowed to have, they're not allowed to partake in my Passover because they are not within my covenant that I have made with my faithful servant Abraham, do you see? Okay, let's continue. Let's go back. Let's go back. He says, no foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. He's very adamant about this. This is the second time he said that now. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside of the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. Why is that? Because God was going to use this at the cross. It was customary for the Romans to break the legs of those on the cross so that they would sink down. And in sinking down with their arms being nailed up, they would suffocate to death. They would no longer be able to hold themselves up. And so uh, that's why they broke their legs. Yeshua's legs were not broken. Not one bone in Yeshua's body was broken. As badly as he was beaten, as badly as he was punched, slapped, spit upon, scourged, none of his bones were broken. And this was going to be another qualifier that would qualify Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek, to be the uh, anointed one, that the, the Passover lamb that God uh, was telling us was to come. Okay? So God was using this as a qualifier. And so he says, when you eat this lamb in your house, he says, don't take any of the flesh outside of the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. Now, here is where we get into who the house of Israel was. Listen to this, Exodus chapter 12, verse 48. If a stranger shall sojourn, that's travel. Now, a stranger was a Gentile. Uh, okay, I want us to understand this. Who was a stranger? A stranger was someone not born by blood into the house of Israel. He's a stranger, right? If a Gentile stranger shall sojourn, travel with you, and he'd like to keep the Passover to Yahovah. Again, this is a Passover to Yahovah. It honors Yahovah. That's what the Passover does. It honors him because it is what he commanded, and it is showing obedience to him, which is the biblical definition of the love of God according to 1 John 5, 3 of the New Testament. If you've never read 1 John 5, 3, please go read it. If a Gentile stranger shall travel with you and would like to keep the Passover to Yahovah, let all of his males be circumcised, then he may come near and keep it. He, the Gentile who travels with you, shall be as a native of the land. Do we see that here, my friends? That Gentile stranger shall be seen as a native of the land. But, God says, no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native, and for the Gentile stranger who travels among you. One law, not two different laws, one law. And all the people of Israel, who were all the people of Israel? They were the 12 tribes of Israel and any Gentile stranger who was grafted in and seen as a native of the land. 
They were a mixed multitude of people, just as we read in Exodus chapter 12, verse 38. There shall be one law for the native-born Israelite and for the Gentile stranger who travels among you. All the people of Israel did just as Yahovah commanded Moses and Aaron, and on that very day Yahovah brought the people of Israel, who were the people of Israel, the twelve tribes of Israel, and the Gentile stranger who is grafted in and seen as a native of the land, a mixed multitude of people out of the land of Egypt by their Hosts. Exodus chapter 12 holds a very important key in understanding who the house of Israel truly was back in the days of Moses. According to Yehovah God, the Passover belongs to him. It's his Passover. He ordained it. He established it. He brought it forth. He commanded it to be kept forever and throughout our generation. And he didn't just command it for the twelve tribes of Israel. He commanded it for the house of Israel, which was a mixed multitude of people. The Passover is his appointment that he established and that he ordained for his people to meet with him. And it was long ago commanded by him that all the congregation of Israel shall keep his Passover. And God was not talking to half of the house of Israel. He was talking to the assembly, which once again made, was made up of a mixed multitude of people, as we have just seen. And it is written that there was one law for both the house of Israel and the Gentile stranger who is grafted in and seen as a native of the land. Okay? Again, I want to take you over here very quickly to Numbers chapter 15, because this is not the only place where we read it. We read it again in Numbers chapter 15. Let's go read that very quickly. Let's read that. Again, Numbers chapter 15, a little bit farther up in the Bible, a little bit farther in the Torah. If a Gentile stranger is traveling with you or anyone is living permanently among you and he wishes to offer a food aroma with a pleasing aroma to Yahuwah, he shall do as you do. For the assembly there shall be one statute for you and for the Gentile stranger who travels with you, a statute forever throughout your generations. You and the traveler shall be alike before Yahuwah. One law and one rule shall be for you and the Gentile stranger who travels with you. Very important. Important? Very important for us to know. Very important for us to understand. Again, when we take a look at uh, the actual word congregation or assembly, when we see the word congregation or assembly, uh, the Hebrew words used here are either the words adah, or kahal. Both of these Hebrew words mean the same thing. They do not mean church. They mean congregation or multitude. Multitude. When God speaks about his congregation or his assembly, he's addressing a mixed multitude of people who know who he is and have will willfully and intentionally chosen to be obedient to him. And obedience, my friends, is the key here. No circumcision, no deal. No law, no deal. No obedience, no deal. You either do as the house of Israel was doing by following the law of God, or no deal. You were left out of the assembly, and you were not seen as a native of the land, which by nature puts you and yours in another whole category that we'll talk about a little bit later as we move on. My friends, it's important uh, that we use the proper wording when we read the Bible. It's important that we go back and look at some of these original Hebrew and Greek words. Uh, even in the New Testament, there's no such thing as the church. Ecclesia in the Greek in the New Testament means assembly. doesn't mean a brick-and-mortar building with a pagan obelisk on its roof. That's not what it means. 
And we need to come out of that stench and that filth of thinking uh, that we must belong to a brick and mortar building or some denominational empire that some man or some charter of men has built. We are part of God's assembly, which is known as the House of Israel. Or we're not. The House of Israel, just as we are told right here in Exodus chapter 12, contained not only those who were born by blood through the lineage of Abraham, but also those Gentile strangers who had been spiritually grafted into the house of Israel and were seen by God as, and I quote, natives of the land, who understood that there was one law and one rule for everyone within the one house of Israel. Not two separate laws, not two separate houses, not two separate rules. One. One. And that number one is tectonically important. Why do you suppose it is that today's modern-day professing Christian does not know about or understand the spiritual and salvational significance of God's Passover? Think about that for just a moment. We'll come back to that question a little bit later in the study. There is absolutely no question about who the original house of Israel was from the very beginning. And the fact that the house of Israel did not only contain Jews, it did not only contain Benjamites, it did not only contain the tribe of Issachar, Zebulun, Gad, Aster, Joseph, or Levi, Reuben, Simeon, Dan, or Naphtali. The house of Israel from the very beginning was a mixed multitude of people, some of which were born by blood into the twelve tribes of Israel, and some who were grafted in through the spirit of obedience to Yahovah God, which is the biblical definition of the love of God. But make no mistake about it. Whether you were born by blood into the house of Israel, or whether you were circumcised and grafted into the house of Israel spiritually through obedience to God, showing your love for Jehovah God, you were seen as a native of the land. You always have been. Consider this. In the very first chapter of the New Testament, Matthew gives us the gen genealogy of Yeshua, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And within that human genealogy, there are Gentiles. Both Rahab and Ruth were Gentiles who were found within the gene genealogy of Yeshua in the book of Matthew. Rahab was a Canaanite woman. She wasn't an Israelite. Ruth was a Moabite woman, not an Israelite. Yet, both of these Gentiles are found within the lineage of the Lamb of God. Why? Because God, from the very beginning, was grafting the nations of the world into the house of Israel. And friends, this is not new. This is not just something that started in the New Testament. This was already being implemented clear back in the days of ex the, the Exodus of Moses, which is utterly astounding considering the fact that most modern-day Christians today have no clue what they have been grafted into or why. They're completely oblivious. Keeping all of this in mind, the ideology, or, or, or the ideology that uh, uh, that ideology that the church preaches and teaches today, that says that we as modern day Christians are somehow separate and apart from the house of Israel, is a sin. It is a sin to preach such a thing. The very concept or ideology or hermeneutical understanding or denominational dogma or philosophical construct that teaches and preaches that today's modern-day Christian is somehow separate and apart from the house of Israel is indeed sinful by its very nature because it is blatantly, willfully, and intentionally taught as a tool 
that is being used to add to God's word and to take away from God's word. You simply cannot say that God has said when God has not spoken. It was forbidden back in the days of Moses, and it's forbidden today in our time as well, and for good reason. My friends, when you add to the Word of God, when you take away from the Word of God, you are usurping the power and the authority of God. Back when the temple of God was still standing, they took such men outside the city and they stoned them to death for speaking falsely against God. And I tell you the truth, men like these, who are indeed false apostles, are no longer stoned to death because we no longer have God's temple or his high priest or his Levitical judicial system here on earth. But know this, that man that speaks presumptuously, adding to God's word and taking away from God's word will ultimately be put to death. In the end, make no mistake about it, my friend. Those who do such things, just like the Pharisees and the scribes and the high priests and the pastors of, uh, of our Messiah's time, were called by our Messiah, by the Lamb of God, children of the devil. Men today who do the same thing are the same men who are dressing themselves up as angels of light in order to fool, if possible even the very elect. Keeping all of that in mind, and now knowing and understanding that the house of Israel was always made up of both Israelites and Gentiles who were grafted into the house of Israel to be one people in the eyes of God, let me ask you this. What is the, bene the benefit of being a Jew? Do you know what your Bible says about the benefit of being a Jew? Because this is important. Even though the Apostle Paul himself was not a Jew, but came from the tribe of Benjamin, I'd like for us to listen closely to how the Apostle Paul exemplifies the Jewish people even more positively than he does his own tribe of Benjamin. We can read that in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Let's go read that. Again, very important. We're going to turn to the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Paul says this, Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way, says Paul, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. My friends, let me ask you this. Where do we think the Bible came from? Who gave us God's Word, the Bible? Where did that come from? Why do we think that it is written that the ruler's staff would not depart from between the feet of Judah, the Jews? Why do we think that God brought the Jews back to Jerusalem and not the rest of the tribes of Israel? Why do you think that is? And who do we think that Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek, who is the Lamb of God, mind you, was? And who do you think Yeshua came for first, the Jew or the Gentile? You may be surprised to know the biblical answer to that. Did you know and are you aware of the biblical fact that salvation comes from the Jews? Have you ever wondered why it is that in these last days the world hates the Jews above and beyond every other people on the face of the earth? Have you ever wondered why that isn't it? Isn't it almost supernatural? You look around you, everybody hates the Jew. Are we so blind, so deaf, so dumb, that we do not know why the world hates the Jews the way that it does? Was this not prophesied about by the very mouth, the very breath, the very tongue of God himself, who is the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? 
Did Yahuwah God himself not tell us that he would make Jerusalem a burdensome stone and a cup of trembling to the world in the last days? He most certainly did. Oh, how soon we forget. Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 says this, The oracle of the word of Yahovah concerning Israel. Thus declares Yahovah, who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding people. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the people. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves and all the nations of the earth will gather against it. On that day, declares Yahuwah, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness. But for the sake of the house of Judah, the Jews, I will keep my eyes open when I will strike every horse of the people with blindness. Then the clans of Judah shall say to themselves, The inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength through Yahuwah of hosts. There God. Are we as Christians oblivious to what God promised? What the world, along with its newfound Roman style religion, does not understand is that salvation in of itself, salvation in of itself, my friends comes from the Jew. The ruler's staff shall not depart from between the feet of Judah. The Jew, who God gave the oracles, his oracles, his law, his commandments, to, to share with the world. Not says I, but once again says the Lamb of God. Listen closely to what the Lamb of God told the Samaritan woman at the well in the book of John. Again, I want us to go back, take a look at that. Very important. What did our Messiah say to the Samaritan woman at the well? John, uh, and I want to go here and I want to read this here. It says, a woman, John chapter 4, verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Yeshua said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, get that, my friends? Was Yeshua a Jew? He most certainly was. It's right here in John chapter 4, verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. We'll come back to that in just a moment, why it was that they had no dealings with the Samaritans. Yeshua answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to her, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us a well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Yeshua said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give them will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And Yeshua said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered, I have no husband. And Yeshua said to her, You're right in saying, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to her, or the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Yeshua said to her, listen to closely, my friends, Woman, believe me, 
The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We, the Jews, worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. Says the Lamb of God. According to the very breath, the very Lamb of God himself, the Jew, Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek, salvation itself is from the Jews. Why do you think the world hates the Jews? Why does Yeshua say that salvation comes from the Jews? Why does he say that? Because Yeshua, who is the Lamb of God, was, is, and always will be a Jew. And we'll show you the biblical evidence of that biblical fact as we move forward. Just as even the Samaritan knew he was a Jew. You see, this is why the world hates the Jews. The hatred of the Jew is a supernatural and spiritually led demonic hatred that comes from being deceived and once again not knowing what God has spoken, not knowing what the Lamb of God has spoken, or even who he was. Let us now turn to the book of Acts so that we may hear the Apostle Peter and what Peter told his disciples concerning who Yeshua was, is, and always will be. This also very interesting. Acts chapter 3, verses 22 through 26. Again, very important scripture. Let's go take a look at that. We're going to move into the book of Acts. We're just, we're just weaving all through the Bible just to reinforce everything that it is that we are saying here. Acts chapter 3, verse 22 through 26. Moses said, what? Moses said? Yeah, Peter's talking about Moses. Isn't that surprising? Did you know that over two-thirds of the Bible almost is, is nothing but quotes from the Old Testament? Most Christians are completely oblivious to that. Peter says, and is concerned with, what Moses said. What did he say? Peter says that Moses said, the Lord God, Yahovah, will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that very soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel to those who came after him also proclaim these days, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring, get that, my friends, not offsprings, not plural, singular, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first. You who? You Jews. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Peter says that Moses said, that God would raise up for the house of Israel a prophet likened unto Moses from among the brothers of the house of Israel. And it would be to this prophet that God would raise up from the brothers of the house of Israel that the house of Israel should listen to. And please take note of the fact that Peter also tells us in verse 26 that God, after raising up this prophet, from among the brothers of the house of Israel, has sent him to the Jews first. God sent this prophet likened unto Moses, who he has raised up from among the brothers of the house of Israel, to the Jews. Why? So that the world would know and understand once again that salvation comes from the Jews. And where did Peter get this idea that God would raise up a prophet like undone to Moses from among the brothers of the house of Israel? Where did he get that from? Peter was quoting from God's promise to the house of Israel found in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Let's go read it so that we know. Again, solid foundation. Let's stand on some solid foundation. Deuteronomy chapter 18. 
a prophet like unto Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 22 says this, Yahovah, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me from where? Where is he going to raise him up from? From among you, from your brothers, says Moses. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of Yahovah your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of Yahovah my God, or to see this great fire any more, lest I die. And Yahovah said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. Now what's, what's Moses doing here? He's reminding them that when God came down, God came down personally to thunder his testimony, what many people call his Ten Commandments. When he came down to thunder his testimony, those Ten Commandments that he gave, the people were scared to death. There were peals of thunder, and the earth quaked, and there was smoke. They couldn't see anything. So they ran to Moses, and they said, Moses, you go speak to him, and you tell us what he says, and we'll do it. So Moses became the one mediator between God and man. And God agreed with this, and he said, they are right in what they have spoken. Okay? He continues on, and he says, so, so, God, so Moses, God is helping them to understand. Look, Moses is the mediator between me and you. I'm going to send you another mo- mediator. Who's the one mediator between God and man today, according to, to uh, the New Testament? Yeshua is the one mediator between God and man, right? So what is God telling the the house of Israel? He's telling them, look, I'm going to raise up from among your brothers a prophet likened unto Moses. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, Moses, from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whosoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, get this, my friends. I want you to think about the pastors and the priests and the Pharisees of today. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how how may we know the word that Yahovah has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of Yahuvah, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that Yahuvah has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, and you need not be afraid of him. Once again, my friends, the Lamb of God was raised up, created by God, to be a second prophet likened unto Moses. Where did he raise him up from? Among the brothers of the house of Israel. The Lamb of God was raised up, created by God from among the brothers of the house of Israel. And in order to know exactly how and who it was among the brothers of the house of Israel that he would raise him up from and bring him forth, who, who is he going to bring this prophet forth through? Likened unto Moses. We need only to read 2 Samuel chapter 7 as the story unfolds along with God's plan of salvation for mankind. Let's go take a look at that, 2 Samuel chapter 7. We talk about this all the time because it is so pivotal in everything that we teach. Again, very important for us to know. 2 Samuel here, chapter 7. I'd just like to start down here at verse 12. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. This is Yahuwah God and his promise to David. He's speaking to David. He says, David, when your days are fulfilled and when you lie down with your fathers, I'll raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, your bowels, David. And I will establish his kingdom. He, he who? He, he, the descendant that God is going to create and raise up from the body of David, from the bowels of David, he shall build a house for my name. And I'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house, David, and your kingdom, David, shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne, David, 
shall be established for ever. Once again, we mention this particular scripture continuously all throughout our teachings because it is so pivotal and so monumental in the fact that this very promise to David from God explains without question the true identity and what qualifies the true Lamb of God to be the Lamb of God. Let me say this, my friends. If the Jesus of the church today was not created by God from the seed of David, from the bowels of David, according to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, if the Jesus of the church today was not raised up by God from among the brothers of the house of Israel, if the Jesus of the church today is not a prophet likened unto Moses, if the Jesus of the church today is not a Jewish man, then the Jesus of the church today is as the Apostle Paul has already told us, clearly and unequivocally, another Jesus. And those who teach and preach another gospel or another Jesus, according to the Apostle Paul, are to be accursed. Galatians chapter 1. Verses 6 through 10. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of the Messiah and are turning to a different gospel. My friends, was this going on in Paul's time? You bet it was. This is nothing new what we face today. This is absolutely nothing new. Let me read that to you again. Paul comes back to Galatia and he says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is one, Paul says, but there are some who trouble you who want to distort the gospel of Christ. Was that going on in Paul's day? You bet. Should it surprise us that it's going on in our day? Absolutely not. It shouldn't surprise us. We should be on guard. Paul says, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now we say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you have received, where did they receive it from? They received it from the Old Testament. All of the qualifiers of the the Lamb of God to come. Everything that qualifies him to be the, qualifi- the, the, the to to be the Messiah, Every, everything there, who he was going to come from, where he was going to come from, what this was all going to be about, is the gospel, my friends. It's all the gospel. As we have said before, so now we say again: If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Now listen to what Paul says here in verse 10. It's very important. For am I now seeking of the approval of man or God? That's a question every Christian should be asking themselves today. For am I now seeking the approval of man or God? Or am I trying to please man? Paul says this. He says, if I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of the Messiah. In other words, my friends, if you're still trying to serve man, you're not a servant of the Messiah. Do you see how dangerous, do you see how damnable it is to add to God's word or to take away from God's word? Do you see why the Lamb of God called the so-called men of God back in his day twofold children of hell? Matthew chapter 23. Verse 15. Matthew chapter 23, verse 15. Let me read this to you. Put this in your hearing. Red letter words from our Messiah. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you pastors and priests, you hypocrites, for you travel across land and sea to make a single proselyte, a single follower. And when he becomes a proselyte, a follower, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. One of the reasons that so many people look down at God's Passover 
is because of their utter hatred and disdain for the Jews. Never really considering who it was that brought them the word of God in the first place, let alone the Lamb of God that has the ability to take away sin, who was clearly and unarguably a Jew. But there's more. And if you are an anti-Semite who hates Jews, you're going to really hate what's coming up next. Who or what is a true God-fearing, Messiah-following, cross-bearing Christian grafted into? Have you ever heard of the priestly prayer? I'd like for us to read that priestly prayer before we go any farther. We can find that priestly prayer prayed by the Lamb of God in John chapter 17, verses 15 through 26. Let's go read it. John chapter 17, verses 15. I just want to read verses 15 through 26. This is Yeshua. He's praying to his Father. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. My friends, does Yeshua want us to be taken out of the world? No. No. Why? Because we inherit the earth. We are not taken out. The evil are taken out. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Yeshua says they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. There's that word truth again. The word of God is truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. What did we just read in the book of Exodus? That if a man was circumcised, and that if he did as the house of Israel did, he would be what? He would be seen as a native of the land. He would be one, one law, one rule, would become one people in the eyes of God. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me I have given to them, that they may be, be even as one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. How many times do you have to say it? One, 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 one. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. My friends, did Yahuwah God already know what he was going to do at the found, before the foundation of the world? He most certainly did. This plan of salvation was already conceived in his mind before he ever even created mankind. Where does mankind come from? The dust of the earth. What came first, man or the earth? The earth, because man was created from the dust of the earth. Did God know before he ever even created man what he was going to do? He most certainly did. Did he know that the serpent was in the garden? He most certainly did. Did he know that man was going to fall and be tempted and, and fall? and that God was going to have to rescue him, he most certainly did. The knowledge of Yeshua was known by God far before the foundation of the earth, my friends. That is the wisdom and the power of God. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these who know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. If you are a Jew hater, then you are exempt from being a Christian. Because a Christian is someone who has been made one with the very Jewish Lamb of God. 
Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 through 29 says it very nicely. Let's go read that very quickly. Again, Paul speaking to the church at Galatia, the assembly at Galatia. He says, For as many of you has were that were baptized into the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, have put on the Messiah, who was, is, and always will be a Jew. Remember that, my friends, the very Jewish Messiah. So as many of you as were baptized into the Messiah, but on the Messiah, there's neither Jew nor Greek. And again, a Greek was a Gentile. So there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in the Messiah, Yeshua. And if, there's that big battleship of a word again, if, if you are the Messiah's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The word one, the number one in the Bible, is tectonically important, my friends. What has the true God-fearing, Messiah-following, cross-bearing Christian been grafted into? The house of Israel, where there is one law and one rule. Make no mistake about it, my friends. If you are a true Christian, you have been grafted into a very Jewish family by a very Jewish man who just happens to be the Lamb of God. The true Lamb of God was, is, and always will be a Jew who came from the very body of David, the very tribe of Judah, not says I, but says the Lamb of God. Let's go hear that from his lips. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to testify to you about all these things for the assemblies. I am the root and the descendant of David. The bright morning star, is there any doubt that Yeshua is the descendant of David, my friends? Unless you're calling Messiah Yeshua a liar, there is no doubt and there is no question. For those of you who think that a true Christian is not part of the house of Israel and God's very Jewish family, you better think again. Listen closely to how the Apostle Paul explains what a true Christian has been grafted into. And please keep in mind that we've already read the book of Exodus concerning the Gentiles being grafted into the house of Israel back in the days of Moses. This, my friends, is not separate and apart from that. This is one with that same concept. Romans chapter 11. Let's go read that. Very important chapter, my friends. I want us to read it, know it, understand it. Romans, we're going to start with verse 1. Romans chapter 11. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, Paul says, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know that what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? He says, Lord, they've killed your prophets, they've demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what did God say to him? What was God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace, says Paul. But if it is by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking? The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. My friends, what Paul is explaining here is the believing, the difference between a believing Jew and a non believing Jew. A Jew who believes and accepts the Passover Lamb of God, and the Jew who does not. He continues, So I asked then, did they, the Jews, stumble in order that they might fall? 
Paul says, by no means, rather through their trespass, the trespass of the Jews, salvation is come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass, the Jews' trespass, means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentile, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I am speaking to you Gentiles, and as much uh, then as I myself am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to somehow make some of my fellow Jews jealous, and thus save some of them. For if their rejection, the rejection of the Jews, means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. Who's he talking about there? Who's the, who's the dough offered? Yeshua, the Lamb of God. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches, the Jews, talking about the Jews, were broken off, and you, although a wild a Gentile, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, you Gentiles do not be arrogant towards the branches, the Jews. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. That goes right back to Genesis. The ruler's staff will not depart between the feet of Judah. That's the root. Then you will say, well, the branches, the Jews, were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Paul says, that's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you, as a Gentile, stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, you Gentile, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, the Jews, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided, Gentile, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too, Gentile, will be cut off. Very important scripture here. Let me read that to you again. Romans chapter 11, verse 22. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. And even they, the Jews, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted back in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and you were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Paul continues, he says, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come again upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Again, my friends, did you, did you pick that up? Did you under did you did that hit you? Did you under did that did that make the gears in your brain click? Think. What did he just say? Let's read that again. He's talking to Gentiles. He says, "You Gentiles, lest you be wise in your own sight, I want you to be a, a, a I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery." He says this. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Come into what? Come into the house of Israel. In this way, all Israel will be saved. In other words, what Paul is saying is all Israel is not just the Jews. We're waiting for the fullness of the Gentiles to come into Israel. In this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Listen closely. As regards the gospel, they, the Jews, are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Who did God call? He called the house of Israel, which includes the Jews. That's irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received the mercy because of the Jews' disobedience, 
So too, the Jews now have been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may have mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord Yehovah, or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. What a absolutely astounding chapter of the Bible. And yet, Christians are completely oblivious to what they've been grafted into. They have no idea the importance of the house of Israel that we are. My friends, have you ever heard anyone shamefully proclaim that that's, that's just for the Jews? Or this is, this is just for the Jews? This Sabbath is just for the Jews? Or that Sabbath is just for the Jews? Or this feast day is just for the Jews? Or that feast day is just for the Jews? You ever heard any of that nonsense? Once again, today's modern day so-called men of God that are standing behind literally thousands of pulpits today in our time who shamefully teach and preach that the house of Israel only consists of born and bred Jews, according to the flesh exclusively, are indeed under a curse. They are willfully and intentionally teaching another gospel message. And it's important that we understand that this devilish man-made ideology that separates the Jew from the Gentile is not something new. And we'll read more about this shameful deception as we move forward. But what's important to understand is that this demonically inspired teaching was condemned by the Apostle Paul himself in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's also go read that as well. Again, these men were alive and well. It's the same spirit that is in the same spirit of deception, my friends. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 15 says this. I wish you would bear with me in a, a little foolishness. Do bear with me. For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to the Messiah. But I am afraid that as the serpent deserved, deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to the Messiah. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. <laughs> Do you hear the anxiety in Paul's voice? Can you hear it? He says, if somebody comes preaching something else, you put up with it readily enough. He says, indeed, I consider that I am not in least inferior to these super apostles. My friends, do we have super apostles on the earth today? Do we have super apostles out all over the internet, all over the world wide web? These guys who are, think they're super apostles? They, we certainly do. Did, did Paul have to contend with them back in his day? He most certainly did. Has anything changed? It has certainly not. Paul says, I in, uh, indeed, I consider that I'm not in the least inferior to these super apostles, even if I am unskilled in speaking, I'm not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted, because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you, and was in need. I do not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. 
and what I am doing I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do. Once again, Paul is railing against these false apostles. He's railing against them the same way that Yeshua railed against them and called them twofold children of hell and whitewashed tombs that were beautiful on the outside but full of dead men's bones on the inside, a brood of snakes and vipers. Paul's letting them have it. For such men are false apostles. Deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of the Christ, of the Messiah. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is of no surprise if his, if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end correspond to their deeds. My friends, remember what I told you before. Men who preached outside the word of God, who said things that God did not say, were taken out side the city and stoned to death for doing that. And just because men today are getting away with it for the time being doesn't mean that they're not going to be stoned outside the city in the end. That day's coming. That day's coming. You see, this war that we fight is not a new war, my friends. This spiritual warfare that Paul speaks of in Ephesians chapter 6 has been going on ever since the days of the Apostle Paul and the Apostles. That's why no Christian knows about the Passover. Christians don't even care about the Passover. They have no concept that without the Passover, you don't have salvation. You don't have a Passover lamb. You got nothing. Nothing. But do they want to keep that in remembrance? Do they want to honor God that gave the Passover lamb, that raised up his prophet like unto to Moses from among the house of, uh, uh, the, uh, of Israel and among the brothers of Israel? Do they want to praise and honor that? No. They want to put stuffed chocolate in the mouths of their children and choke the living daylights out of them, hiding the true meaning of the Passover of God that exalts his Passover lamb and God himself who gave us that Passover lamb. Do you see the apostasy? For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen disguising themselves as the apostles of the Christ, the Messiah. My Lord, clear back, clear back then, they had super apostles who were no apostles at all, and Paul railed against them endlessly, for these men were false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as the apostles of the Messiah. My friends, I am well aware of the fact that there are some out there who get tired of me teaching and preaching these things rep repetitively, each and every time that I teach and each and every time that I preach, but I cannot preach what has not been given to me to teach and preach. This is a state of emergency. This is not some kind of joke or some kind of insignificant, trivial thing. This is without question a matter of life and death. And the world is soon to find that out in the very near future. We are to be the light of the world, not the darkness. We are to be the salt of the earth that preserves the word of God. Not those who add to the word of God or take from the word of God or mix and mingle the word of God with pagan man-made filth and trash that teaches our children nothing of God and nothing of his Passover lamb. Once again, I want to stay the course with this biblical narrative that clearly defines what it means for a Christian to be grafted into the house of Israel and how important it is for us Christians to do as our Jewish Messiah did and to walk as our Jewish Messiah walked. Let us now turn to Matthew chapter 15 this morning.
This is about the event that took place concerning a Canaanite woman who was clearly born by, not born by blood into the house of Israel. She was a Gentile Canaanite woman. Let's listen closely to this lesson that the Lamb of God teaches us through the book of Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Let's go take a look at that very quickly. Again, this is an astonishing uh, study right here that continues to help us to know and to understand why the Passover, again, is so tectonically important. Matthew chapter 15, and I want to go to uh, 21, verses 28 right here. The faith of a Canaanite woman. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 says, And Yeshua went away from there, and he withdrew to the district of Tyre of Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she's crying out after us. And Yeshua answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. My friends, I'd like you to highlight that in your Bible. Matthew chapter 15, verse 24. What does Messiah say to this Gentile woman? He says, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and she knelt down before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it's not right to take the children's bread and to throw it to the dogs. And she said, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Yeshua answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Now, my friends, when we read this scripture, many of us have no concept or no understanding of what's going on here. And so I want to break this down for you, and I want you to understand what happened here. Yeshua says, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why did he say that? Because that's who he was sent to first. We've already established that. Before he, he did not come to preach this message uh, of salvation to the Gentile first. He came to teach it to the, to the Jew first. The Jew rejected it. And so, again, it went out more so to the Gentiles than it did the Jews, in order to make the Jews jealous, just as Paul tells us in the 11th chapter of the book of Rome, Romans. Okay? So what's going on here? What's going on here? Once again, if you don't uh, already have Matthew chapter 15, verse 24 highlighted in your Bible, please do so. Once again, the Lamb of God that God raised up to be a prophet likened unto Moses from among the brothers of the house of Israel clearly told his disciples that he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why did he say that? Because just as we have already read, salvation comes from the Jews. David was a Jewish man from whose body Yeshua was created by the hand of God, raised up from among the brothers of the house of Israel, just as God had promised. If these things didn't happen, then God lied. Why? In order to fulfill the prophecy of Jacob, whose name was changed by God to Israel. And once again, my friends, I want to go read this, because I want to make sure that this is not just in your hearing, but also in your sight as well, that you remember it. Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience, key word there, obedience of the people. A word, again, another word, obedience, that the church today hates. The lesson that we learned from the Lamb of God concerning the Canaanite woman is a lesson that he was clearly teaching his disciples, who had been taught that all Gentiles those not born by blood into the house of Israel, were dogs. You see, that's what the men of God back then were teaching. They were teaching that the Jews were supreme and the Gentiles were dogs. You couldn't even enter a, a, the house of a Gentile. You, they were dogs. They were unclean. You see, this is what the Pharisees and the scribes were, who were the men of God at, at, during his time, were teaching people. You couldn't even enter the house of a Gentile dog because they were not of God. They were unclean. They were uncommon. We see evidence of this in Acts chapter 10, which also many Christians don't understand, when Peter has this vision of a sheet full of all kinds of unclean animals. 
which I cannot tell you how many times I have heard absolutely twisted inside and out. Let's go read that because this also has been a scripture that many false apostles have completely misinterpreted and turned inside and out without any understanding at all whatsoever. Acts chapter 10, and I want to go back and, and prove this idea that the men of God back then were calling Gentiles dogs. Again, let's go read that very quickly. Acts chapter 10, I just want to read 9 through 29 here very quickly. All this welds together. All of this welds together. And we're going to go to uh, Acts chapter 10. Here we go. And I just want to read through uh, 9 through 28. It says this. The next day they were on a journey and approaching the city. Peter went up to the housetop on the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and he wanted some to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending being let down by its four corners upon the earth. And there were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him that said, Rise, Peter, eat, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is uncommon or unclean. Peter knew that there were certain animals that God forbids us to eat. He was obeying the law of God. So he knew. There was no question in Peter's mind. He wasn't allowed to do that. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed, in other words, Peter was confused. He, he says right here, I, don't, I, I have no idea what, what in the world that just meant. While Peter was inwardly perplexed, confused as to what the vision he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made an inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. Now, remember, Cornelius was a Gentile centurion. And he loved God, a Roman centra, he was a Roman soldier. And Cornelius uh, was visited by an angel, and the angel told Cornelius, go get Peter, he'll explain all this to you. Okay? So not only is Cornelius going to get a lesson, but so also Peter is going to get a lesson. Okay? So Peter's in, inwardly perplexed about all this vision that he's seeing, and then, he said, but then all of a sudden he's got these guys outside of the house from this centurion Cornelius, and they want to know, is, is Peter there? And, and there are three men looking for him. And he says, rise and go down. And while Peter was pondering the vision, again, Peter's still pondering the vision here in verse 19, right? Doesn't know what it means. The Spirit said to him, behold, there are three men looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them, accompany them without hesitation for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and he said, I'm the one you're looking for. What's the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to see it to, to his guests. <laughs> Excuse me. The next day he rose and he went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied them. And on the following day entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and he found many persons gathered. Listen to this now, Acts chapter 10, verse 28. And he said to them, you yourselves, this is Peter talking to Cornelius' family. Peter says, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation, but, but God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. What was the vision of the sheet of clean and unclean animals all about? It was about God's disdain for the men of God who were teaching people that the Gentiles were unclean or uncommon. All throughout Acts chapter 10, Peter's confused. Peter's confused. He's perplexed. He doesn't get it. He's pondering the vision. He doesn't get it until verse 28. 
when he walks in and he sees what's going on here. Once again, my friends, Peter's vision of the sheet full of unclean and common animals that Peter knew full well that he could not eat according to the law of God was not understood by Peter, just as we're told in Acts chapter 10, verse 17. Peter was perplexed, in other words. He was confused and confounded about the vision and did not understand it until he went to the Roman centurion's house, whose name was Cornelius, and saw that this Gentile family was indeed told by an angel of God to go fetch him. And Peter, so that Peter could witness the faith of this Gentile family in God and the spirit that God had given them. Once Peter goes to this Gentile home and sees the faith of this Gentile family and the spirit of God that had been given to them, this is when Peter, it finally snaps in Peter's mind. He finally understands the vision of the uh, sheet full of animals. And Peter tells us in verse 28 that God has shown him that he should not call any person uncommon or unclean. It has, has nothing to do with eating unclean animals, my friend. And so once again, I tell you this story and I show you this so that you will understand what the men of God were teaching. That you couldn't enter the home of a Gentile. They were dogs. Once again, this was in direct opposition to what the so-called men of God back in that day were teaching. They were teaching the opposite of what God was saying. Much like the so-called men of God today are teaching about the Jews. They were teaching people that all Gentiles not born by blood in the house of Israel were dogs and that you couldn't even eat with such, you couldn't even go to their house, couldn't even visit them. They were literally proclaiming to all Gentiles to be uncommon or to, uh, to be unclean. Now, keeping that in mind, we've already proven that that's what the men of God were teaching, right? God was, had a disdain for that and was teaching Peter a lesson concerning it, okay? Let's now uh, go back uh, to this uh, Canaanite woman. It's because now we're going to better understand this now. Okay? So let's go back. As we flash back to the Canaanite woman and the lessons that Yeshua was in the process of teaching his disciples, this Gentile Canaanite woman was crying out to the Lamb of God to heal her daughter who was severely oppressed by a demon. Yeshua's disciples were greatly agitated by this. They had no heart for this woman because they saw her as a dog. Because that's what they'd been taught. And they tell Yeshua, send her away, send her, she's just a bother to us, send her away. Upon which time Yeshua decides to teach them all a lesson. The same lesson that Peter had to learn. Yeshua turns to the, 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 the Gentile Canaanite woman and he says, I was sent only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But instead of stopping, this Gentile Canaanite woman came and knelt down before Yeshua on her knees with tears in her eyes and she continued to beg him to help her. Now keep in mind that the disciples were watching all of this taking place. And by this point in time, his disciples were surely having second thoughts about sending her away as she was there weeping and kneeling down before him and calling him Lord. Surely in their minds they were beginning to think, uh... Maybe we shouldn't uh, just dismiss this woman so quickly, right? But Yeshua reinforces his rejection of her, and he says, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Get that, my friends, to throw it to the dogs, which is what the Pharisees and the scribes and the so-called men of God were teaching that the Gentiles were, right? And so you can imagine that the disciples are probably shocked because he's continuing to, to reject her the same way they were doing, right? This is a lesson to his disciples. But the woman looks up at him and she says, Yes, Lord, but yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Please notice that this gentle Canaanite woman has called our Messiah Lord at least three times that we know of, upon which time the Lamb of God grants her request because of her faith. What we're witnessing here is the grafting in of the Christian to the house of Israel. Yeshua says, I was only sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She was not granted into the house of Israel until she knelt down before him and called him Lord. 
And his disciples learned a very important lesson that day, that once again the men of God of that time had duped them. Because at that moment, she was, just like all other Gentiles, grafted into the house of Israel, which is the apple of God's eye. And don't think for a moment that his disciples weren't astonished at what had just happened right in front of them, because once again, this was not what the so-called men of God of that time were teaching. My friends, there's so much more to explain. We're going to get into just a little bit more. We're going to take a break here for just a couple of minutes, and when we do, we're going to come back and finish uh, what it is that we have to, again, say here, and what it is that we have to show and prove to everyone that if there is no Passover, there is no salvation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody, and thank you for staying with us. And so, what can we take from all of this information that we have gathered here this morning? From the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, there are two different families mentioned in the Bible, two very different children, and these two different families are written about in Genesis chapter 3. That's what all of this boils down to. Let's go read that. Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to turn to Genesis chapter 3 this morning, and I want to read verses 14 through 15. And this is when uh, the serpent had just got done, once again, deceiving mankind in the garden. And this is what, you, this is what our Father in heaven says, Yahuwah says to the serpent. Yahovah God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. My friends, does the serpent have offspring? Yes. There are two families that walk the face of the earth this very day. Two, only two that God is concerned with. 
He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He, the offspring of the human woman, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In the end, there are only two families that walk upon the face of the earth today. There is the family of the serpent, and there is the family of God. And Yahuwah God is long ago distinguished and given evidence as to who these two families are and what separates these two families, clear back in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Let's go read that. Again, very important. Deuteronomy chapter 30. This is the dividing line, uh, if you will, that separates these two families that we read about in Genesis. The choice of life and death. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 20. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. My friends, this is the book of Deuteronomy. Have you ever heard a pastor or a man of God try to tell you that God's law is too hard for you and you can't keep it? Is that what God says? That's not what God says. Not right here in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. He says, For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. He says, neither is it far off. He said, it's not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven to us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who shall go over the sea to and, and bring it to us so, so that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you, God says. It's in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil evil. My friends, this is the if equals then concept that we uh, talk about. Uh, we talk about that all the time within uh, this ministry. There is an if equals then concept that has been from the very beginning. If you obey the commandments of Yahovah your God that I command you today, by loving Yahovah your God, by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live. I want to stop right here, my friends. 1 John 5.3 tells us that the biblical definition of the love of God is that we keep God's commandments and that God's commandments are not burdensome to us. Where did he get that from? He got that from right here in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Do you see the connection between loving God and obedience to God? Obedience is the biblical definition of the love of God. If you obey the commandments of Yahovah your God that I command you today by loving Yahovah your God, by walking in his ways and keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply and Yahovah your God will bless you in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. But, so here we have that if then. Do you see that? If you obey the commandment of Yahovah, then you shall live. If you do this, then I'll do that. Right? Here's another one. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you that then you shall surely perish. If then, if then, you shall not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that your offspring may live, loving Yahovah your God by obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that Yahovah swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. My friends, it's the church keeping the Passover that God commanded his people to keep forever and throughout their generations? Is the church separate and apart from the house of Israel now? I tell you the truth, oftentimes it is. Are there false apostles standing behind the pulpits of today's modern-day churches? I tell you the truth, there is. Should you, as a Christian, keep God's commanded Passover, do you suppose? 
Do you suppose you should follow the Lamb of God, or you, do you suppose you should follow man in some charter of men? My friends, nowhere, absolutely nowhere, does the Bible ever teach and preach that God's feast days and appointments have been abolished. The Lamb of God kept them, the apostles kept them, the early church kept them, and if we indeed pick up our crosses and have made the willful and intentional choice to follow the Lamb of God, we ought to be following Him, doing as He did, walking as He walked, and not, and I repeat, not as the church walks. Without God's Passover and God's Passover, Lamb, there is no salvation. There is no salvation, no redemption, no church, no assembly, no family of God, and quite frankly, no reason to live any longer because there is no hope of any life at all. And that's why the devil hates the Passover and the Jews who brought us the Passover. The Apostle Paul clearly declares the difference between what we know as the church today and those who celebrate the festival of God's Passover, keeping in remembrance the Passover Lamb of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through uh, uh, 8. Let's go take a look at that. Turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 6 through 8. Paul says, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And again, leaven was always a metaphor for sin. That's why during the Passover, you're told to get all the leaven out of your house. And, and in fact, they were to get it out of their community. They weren't even allowed to have it within the gates of Israel. Get all the leaven out because it was a metaphor for sin. He says, your boasting's not good. Do you not know that a little leaven? What's he saying here? He's saying, do you not know that a little sin causes sin throughout the whole lump? What does leaven do? Leaven, why did God use leaven? Because leaven, when you put leaven into a cake or, or cookies or whatever, it goes in and it mixes in it, in it, uh, it, it, uh, it, <clears throat> it grows within the whole, the whole lump and it causes the whole cake to rise. And, and, and what he's talking about is these people, if you let them in this sin, it will again infiltrate the whole assembly and the whole assembly will rise up against God. He says, don't you know that a little sin it, it causes the whole lump to be sinful? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Cleanse out the old leaven, the old sin, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened without sin. For Christ, the anointed one of God, our Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed, says Paul. Paul says, let us therefore celebrate the festival. What festival? The festival of Passover, which includes unleavened bread. It's a seven-day event. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened, sinless bread of sincerity and truth, says the Apostle Paul. Our Father in heaven teaches his children the end from the beginning. Anyone who is not keenly familiar and versed and schooled in the beginning will know nothing of the end. Let's also read that from Isaiah chapter 46, verses 8 through 11. Turning to the book of Isaiah. Remember this and stand for firm. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 8. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, says Isaiah. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient, thing, time, from ancient times things not yet done. This is how God teaches us, my friends. Do we get it? Do we understand? This is why the Passover is important. Everything that he did during the days of the, uh, of the Exodus out from uh, underneath the hand of Pharaoh, he's going to do again. It's going to come full circle. The second prophet, likened unto Moses, is coming. 
He's already been here once. He's going to come back and he's going to do the exact same thing. There will be a greater exodus when he comes to gather all of God's people out of all the nations, not just one nation, but out of all the nations of the earth and brings them back into the land of milk and honey that he promised his faithful servant, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let me read that to you again. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors, you sinners. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there's no other. I am God, there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east the man of my counsel from a far country, talking about Abraham. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. For those of you pew warmers out there who know nothing of the Passover lamb of God, what the Passover lamb of God represents, or what qualifies him to be our Passover lamb, know this. Everything that was prophesied about him in the Law of Moses, the writings of the prophets, and the Psalms had to be fulfilled by him in order for him to qualify to be the Lamb of God. Not says I, but once again says our Passover Lamb. Let's go read that. Red letter words from our Messiah. Luke chapter 24, verse 44 and 45. He said, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the Law of Moses and the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. In order for our Passover lamb to be our Passover lamb, he had to first qualify to be our Passover lamb by once again fulfilling everything written about him within the Law of Moses, the writings of the prophets, and the Psalms. And therefore, as we previously have said, so now we say again, if the Jesus of the church does not fulfill what was written about the Passover lamb within the confines of the law of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms and the Jesus of the church, is an, as the apostle has told us, is another Jesus. The question is, do we know what qualifies our Passover lamb to be our Passover lamb? Do we know what qualifies him and what disqualifies him? How do we know that we're worshiping the right Jesus? Paul talks about there being another Jesus and false apostles teaching another Jesus. So how do we know that we're, that we're, we're worshiping the, the right Jesus, the right Lamb of God, the right Jewish Yeshua? How do we know? by reading the beginning of the Bible and understanding the qualifiers that qualify the true Yeshua to be the true Yeshua, the true Lamb of God. And I also might mention that the scriptures that Yeshua opened the minds of the apostles to understand in verse 45 were not New Testament scriptures. For the New Testament had not yet been written when Yeshua spoke these things. And so I want to go back to that very quickly here. It says, uh, he says, everything written about me in the law of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He's, then he opened up their minds to the scriptures. What, what scriptures? Not the New Testament, because the New Testament wasn't written yet. The scriptures that he was opening the minds of his apostles to understand were the scriptures that they already had, which consisted of the law of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms, i.e. the Old Testament scriptures. Not the new, but the old. When the Apostle Paul told us in, the second, uh, in 2 Timothy that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and training in righteousness, he wasn't talking about the New Testament Scripture because the New Testament had not yet been even penned by the Apostles as of yet. The Scripture that Paul was talking about, that God was that were God-breathed and profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and training and righteousness, was the Old Testament Scripture. Not the new. He was talking about the scripture that they had. And although the same could be said for the New Testament scripture today in our time, 
It must be fully understood that none of us can truly understand what is written in the back of the Bible without first having our minds open to the beginning of the Bible. For it is the beginning of the Old Testament that is the bedrock foundation of what's in the back of the, the Bible in the New Testament. The original Passover that first took place when Yahuwah God led his people out of Egypt through, uh, 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 through his chosen prophet Moses can be found in Exodus chapter 12. If you've not read Exodus chapter 12, I would encourage you to do so, for by doing so you will be introduced to the Lamb of God there, first and foremost. The Exodus, in of itself, was nothing more than a red carpet that our Father in heaven was laying out for the arrival of his Passover lamb to come. And we have seen the evidence of this today in our time. The mystery of God has indeed been revealed to us through the coming of his Passover lamb and the redemption of the innocent blood of God's Passover lamb that has indeed purchased us for a price and has ushered in God's new covenant with his children, who are once again the house of Israel through both blood and spirit. The problem is that most modern-day pew warmers today have no concept of what God's new covenant even is, written about in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. What is the new covenant? How many Christians can answer, what's the new covenant? Let's take the time to examine what God's new covenant with his children, who are also known as the house of Israel, is. Let's go read that, shall we? Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Let's go back here to the Bible. We're going to jump into Jeremiah. We're going to go to 31. We're going to read about this new covenant. Here it comes. Now we're going to start here with Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. It says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahovah. He says, I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor, and each his brother, saying, No, Yahovah, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares Yahovah. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Thus says Yahovah, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that the, its waves roar. Yahovah of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares Yahovah, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says Yahovah, if the heavens above can be measured, and if the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares Yahovah. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahovah, when the city shall be rebuilt for Yahovah from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate, and the measuring line shall go forth straight to the hill of Gareb and shall then turn to Goa. The whole valley of the dead bodies and the ashes and the fields as far as the brook Kidron to the corner of the, ho the horse gate towards the east shall be sacred to Yahovah. It shall not be plucked up or overthrown any more forever. You see, God's promise to his children from the beginning was never to abolish or do away with his law. It was about bringing his children back to his law so that they could understand it. His law, and just as we read here in Jeremiah chapter 31, in, unless you have the ability to change or alter the sun, the moon, and the stars, you are incapable of stopping God from doing what he has promised. You think you can stop God from writing his law across the hearts of his children and in his mind? Well, can you stop the rotation of the earth? Can you stop the sun from coming up? Can you stop the stars from showing up? Can you stop God's heavenly bodies from doing what he has commanded them at their appropriate times? Because if you can, then you can stop God from writing his law across God's uh, people, God, uh, his children's hearts. But if you can't do that, you can't stop God from writing his law across our hearts and in our minds. 
In other words, no matter what other gospel message is preached or taught from behind any pulpit, no matter what another Jesus the church today has created for itself to endear and to worship, no matter what heresy or blasphemy departs from the lips of men, no man or beast has the ability to alter or change the sun, moon, or the stars, and therefore no man or beast has the ability to stop God from doing what he has promised to do and writing his law across our hearts and our minds, says Yehovah God. Let's also turn to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament to read more about this new covenant that God has already made with his children who are the house of of Israel. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's go read that. Again, go moving up into the New Testament. What does it say? It says this, For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, then, after I write my laws on their hearts, after I write my laws in their mind, then I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Which, by the way, does not mean that God's law has changed once again. Is there an offering for sin? Yeah, it's Yeshua, the Lamb of God. Do we make an offering for sin? Every day. Every day. We must. The only way that we can come before God is under the blood of that offering. God's Passover lamb. Once again, this new covenant is not about abolishing the prophets or the law, just as our Messiah told us in the book of Matthew. It's about writing the law of God across the hearts and the minds of his children. Has the law of God been abolished or done away with? I tell you the truth, my friends. The law still stands to this very day, because if the law doesn't stand to this very day, then no one needs a Passover lamb. No one needs to be redeemed from anything. No one needs a savior or a church or a preacher. If God's law no longer stands, then what need of innocent blood do we have? You see, the whole of the Bible can be thrown right into the fire if the devil can get you to believe that God's law has been done away with. That's the objective of the devil. The very reason that we do need a Savior, the very reason that we need a Passover lamb, the very redemptive blood of an innocent lamb provided to us by God himself is because God's law does still stand. And those who have transgressed this law, that is his word, that our Messiah became in the flesh, still has the curse of the law over their heads. First John 3, 4. What is the definition of sin in the Bible? What is the definition of sin? Whoever so committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. That's what sin is. It's the transgression of the law. And what's the wages of transgressing the law? Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin, transgressing the law, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through the Messiah Yeshua our Lord, that Passover lamb. The Apostle John tells us very clearly that the biblical definition of sin is the transgression of the law. And the curse of the law that Paul speaks of is that the wages of sin is death. That is the curse of the law. That's what was nailed to the cross, not the law, my friends. In other words, what we earn from transgressing God's law is death. If God's law is dead and done away with, then no one can earn the wages of death by transgressing a law that no longer exists. So what do they need of a Savior? What was done away with at the foot of the cross was not the law of God. The law of God is the word of God that our Messiah became in the flesh. What God speaks is universal law. As we read in the, in the 11th chapter of the book of Romans, 
God's calling is irrevocable. When God speaks something, it is irrevocable. It was the curse of God's law, the penalty that was nailed to the cross. For those who believe and have faith. Get that, my friends. Only for those who believe and have faith. This is why for us there is no more sacrifice for sin. And yet there is. We are under the blood of that sacrifice, so we cannot say that there's no longer a sacrifice for sin, technically speaking. Again, the law still stands. We need to understand how it stands. We need to understand the law rather than trying to run around saying that it doesn't exist anymore, which makes absolutely no sense and is exactly then the objective of the devil, the serpent, the dragon from the beginning. This is why for us there is no more sacrifice for sin, but not so for those outside of the family of God, for they do not have the redemptive, innocent Passover lamb's blood upon their heads as we do. And even those of us who do have that redemptive, innocent uh, blood of God's Passover lamb covering our heads and our debt and paying for our transgressions, the law of God does indeed uh, not only stand, but is written across our hearts and in our minds so that we do not return like a dog to its vomit or like a pig to its mire, which the church has done, the lawless church has done, while they wait for the lawless one to come, the whole time teaching lawlessness. Listen closely to what Peter tells us about those who have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, and then have turned back, transgressing the law that still exists. Second Peter chapter twenty, or Second Peter chapter two, verses twenty through twenty-two. Let's read that. Second Peter chapter two, verse twenty through twenty two. For if they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What holy commandment? That's God's law, my friends. For it would have better for them never to have known the, the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment of God delivered to them. What the true proverb has said happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. If after receiving the gift of God's new covenant, which is the writing of his law across our hearts and in our minds, Willfully and intentionally, we return to transgressing his law. We make void the new covenant of God's law being written across our hearts and in our minds. And the last date for us will be worse than the first. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. For it is impossible. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. These are people that are completely saved. It's impossible after do, uh, tasting all of this and experiencing all of this and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 31. If we go on sinning, transgressing the law of God. If we go on transgressing the law of God deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
Once saved, always saved in Hollywood's moneymaker concept of a pre-tribulation rescue, along with the church's newfound replacement theology and a lawless Jesus all pale in comparison to what our god breed scripture proclaims from each and every page when understood properly. The name Jesus in of itself was never even heard of until the 16th century. The first King James Version of the Bible does not contain the name Jesus in it anywhere within its scriptures. The J sound of the English language did not exist in the Greek language until the 16th century, and therefore the original Greek name of Yeshua was Jesus, not Jesus. And Jesus is a Greek translation of our Messiah's Hebrew name from Yehoshua, Yeshua for short. And therefore, the name Jesus is a Greek translation of our Messiah's Hebrew name, Yeshua. Let me ask you this. Are you Greek? Was the Lamb of God a Greek man? And if you're not Greek and he's not Greek, then why do we call the Lamb of God by a Greek fabricated name? Ever think about that? It couldn't possibly be the devil's way of kicking dirt over the precious name of God's Passover lamb, could it? Just like he's kicked dirt over the times and the law of God through the confines of Roman Catholicism and its uh, Gregorian-created calendar that we keep today in our time. Couldn't have anything to do with it, could it? What is it that Daniel prophesied so many years ago? You ever thought of that? Let's go take a look. What did Daniel tell us that the beast was going to do? He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. How do you wear out the saints of the Most High? With lies, my friends, deception. He'll speak words against the Most High and he'll wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, time, and a half of time. So how do we know that we do indeed know the correct Yeshua, who is the correct Passover Lamb of God? It's really very simple, my friends. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Let's go read that. Protection. This is protection, my friends. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. By this we know that we've come to know him, if we keep his commandments. That's obedience, my friends. Whoever says, I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth isn't even in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Are we walking as Yeshua walked? Or are we walking as the church walks? Denominational empires of men. Are we doing as Yeshua did? Or are we doing as our man-made denominational empires instruct us to do? Did Yeshua keep his father's Passover? Matthew chapter 26, verse 17 through 19. Did Yeshua keep the Passover? Matthew chapter 26, verse 17 through 19. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, Passover, the disciples came to Yeshua saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Yeshua had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. What took place on that Passover night was well documented, especially by the Apostle John, who wrote extensively about what took place that evening. And according to John, this supper that they were having with Yeshua was a pre-Passover meal, as we have just read, in which Yeshua took the time to teach his apostles how to observe the Passover after his death. Yeshua knew 
that he would not be with them for the actual Passover meal, because at that same time, as the Passover lambs were being slaughtered at the temple, Yeshua himself would be being crucified upon a cross. And therefore, Yeshua begins this pre-Passover meal in which he teaches his apostles to observe the Passover after his death and after the temple will have been taken away from them, which would happen shortly after his death. People ask me all the time, Pastor, how do we keep the Passover? How do we do it? Have you not read your Bible? Our Messiah taught us how to keep it after his death. Do we not know? Yeshua begins by humbling himself and washing the feet of his apostles so that they would understand the importance of being humble and serving and loving one another, and so that they would know that not one of them was above the other. Not one of them. They were to be one. There's no master here. There's no rabbi here. There's no spiritual father among them. They're all one. And they ought to humble themselves and treat each other as one. That was the teaching. And shortly after that, Judas Iscariot has to leave the meal to go meet with the so-called men of God who would that very evening arrest Yeshua. But before they do, Yeshua during that, uh, that time prophesies about Peter denying him three times before the rooster crows. From there, Yeshua teaches them that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he promises them the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of God, would come upon them. And during this time, he teaches them many things. And then he begins his priestly prayer and asks the Father in heaven to make us all one with him, just as he is one with the Father, that we may all be one. You can find that prayer in John chapter 17. Once again, we just read it. Soon after that, Yeshua is betrayed by Judas Iscariot, who betrays him with a kiss. And we all know the rest of the story, or at least we ought to. But the point needs to be made here that the true Yeshua, the true Lamb of God, did indeed not only keep the Passover, he was the Passover Lamb of God. Yeshua who is the only begotten Son of God, written about and promised to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and who was raised up by God to be a prophet likened unto Moses, that God did raise up from among the brothers of the house of Israel, is the reason for the season, the real season, not the devil's season. Without him being our Passover lamb, we once again have no hope, no salvation, no redemption, and no life to look forward to. What do we teach our children during the Roman Catholic created Easter celebration? We teach them to make void the word of God in order to hold on to their own traditions. We teach them about magic Easter bunnies that lay magical colored eggs. We put something sweet in their mouths and we literally choke the life right out of our own children with lies and deception while the devil dances in the streets and laughs at how obedient God's creation is to him. We dress up and we go to a church that says it's preaching and teaching the word of God and about the Son of God, if we're lucky, all the while profaning his name by keeping a Roman Catholic created Good Friday and a pagan Easter that has nothing to do with God's Passover. And then when it's all said and done, we literally support what God says is an abomination to the magic and the divination of a pagan fertility goddess dressed up as a rabbit that has the ability to crap eggs all over the church lawn. Once again, making void the word of God in order to hold on to our own traditions while our children yearn for more chocolate rabbits and something sweet that feeds their sinful flesh. And so it is that we sit comfortably within our own jail cells and once again 
The devil knows that he doesn't even have to shut and lock the jail cell door, because he knows that we'll never leave our sinful comforts. We'll never leave our country club churches. We'll never leave our churchianity for the truth of God's word. Because in the end, God's law is not written across our hearts, and God's new covenant has not been established within our hearts and our minds. And we have been grafted into nothing but a web of deception and degradation. My friends, I had someone that belonged to a denominational church who celebrated the Roman Catholic Good Friday and the Roman Catholic Easter, and they said to me, Well, we teach Jesus crucified. Sure you do, but you also teach magic and divination. What are you teaching your children? You can't add to God's word and take away from God's word. You can't mix pagan things with holy things. My friends, if you're making a steel girder to support something, okay, you're making a steel girder to support something, and you put in the ingredients of what creates and what makes that steel girder, you put flour in there that doesn't belong. That steel girder is no longer a steel girder. It's not going to support the weight that it is supposed to be able to create, that it was created for. You, you've just ruined it. It's, it's not a steel girder anymore. You can hit it with a hammer, it'll break, because it's made of flour. You added something to it, you shouldn't have added it. This is why God says, do not add to my word, do not take away from my word. When you start adding things to God's word, it's not God's word anymore. It's not God's word. It's a mixing and mingling. What did Yeshua chastise the men of God of his time for? Adding to the word of God, taking away from the word of God. You've made void the word of God in order to hold on to your own traditions. You don't, you're not keeping the word of God anymore. You're keeping your own traditions. You're mixing and mingling. There's no strength in God's word anymore when you add your own man-made flavor to it. The new covenant of God that writes his law across our hearts and in our minds can indeed be seen by our Father in heaven through our obedience to him. For just as John tells us in 1 John chapter 5, 3, the love of God is that we keep his commandments and that his commandments are not burdensome to us, which John is once again taking from Deuteronomy chapter 30, which we've just read. My friends, salvation is not a line. Salvation is a circle. If, then, if, if you hear my words, if you keep my commandments, if you are grafted in, then I will bless you. If you turn away from me, then you're done. Life and death, blessings and curses. This very weekend, I tell you the truth, God is watching. When God extends his free gift of salvation, that is God's love he's extending to us, and he expects us to send our love back. Full circle. Not a line. I tell you, my friends, this weekend God is watching. It is not the mark uh, of the beast that we should be afraid of, my friends. For if we have the mark of God upon us, the mark of the beast will be of no consequence to us. I tell you the truth. The mark of God is the love of God. And both belief and faith are action words, my friends. For just as James tells us, our faith is justified by our works. And our good works are a direct result of our love for God. Luke, chapter 22, verse 20. Red letter words from our Messiah as he was sitting at that last Passover meal. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. What was Yeshua doing? He was writing the law of God across the hearts of his followers, completing the new covenant of God, for those who would accept it.
Now that we know what God's new covenant is and what brought us and what, what purchased us, what has established that new covenant within our hearts and within our minds, let's cleanse out the old leaven this season. Let's be a new lump as we really are unleavened and without sin. For the anointed one of God, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the old sin, and the old malice and evil, but with the new, unleavened, sinless bread of sincerity and truth. Whom will you serve this Passover season? As for me and my house, we will serve Yahovah and the Passover lamb that Yahovah himself has raised up from among the brothers of the house of Israel to be his prophet likened unto Moses, who will soon lead us to his chosen set-apart remnant people out from every nation of the earth and finally usher us back into the land that he promised our forefather Abraham. And unless you can change or alter the sun, the moon, and the stars of heaven, you have no way of stopping it. Choose this day whom you will serve, and choose wisely, for I tell you the truth. The sand is right now as we speak, leaving the hourglass. We'll be back in just a moment. Once again, everybody, I just want to say thank you so very, very much for sharing your time with me. I'm Pastor Scott Willing with Holy Impact Ministries, and I would like to ask before I leave that everyone within the sound of my voice, if you've made it all this way through, there is a spirit within you that caused you to sit through this. There is a spirit within you that caused you to want to know more. That is very special, my friends. There are those who do not have the eyes to see or the ears to hear or the drive to want to know. You are blessed and you have been blessed this very day. And I would like to ask you to please take what you've heard here today to your own prayer closet. Bow your knee, bend, bow your head, bend your knee and face the holy promised land of Jerusalem and ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach if what you have heard here today be true or not. 
ask, seek, and knock on his door, on that door, so that the proper door can be opened unto you. Ask, seek, and knock on the proper door, my friends, which is only his door. And if you will do that, my friends, and if you will stay the course to the end, you and I will surely walk through the gates of his soon coming kingdom together. Let's say a quick prayer before we close. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray, Father, blessed and holy is your name. We pray to our Passover lamb this very day, and we say, Happy Passover. Happy Passover, Father. Happy Passover, Messiah Yeshua, our Messiah and King. We thank you so very much for helping us to understand your true identity. We thank you, Father, for giving us all of these qualifiers so that we know that we are indeed worshiping and following after the right Jesus, the right Yeshua. We thank you for giving us his name so that we know what it is. We thank you for giving us your name, Father Yehovah, so that we know what it is, that the name that you have written over 6,000 times within your God-breathed scripture. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for revealing it to those of us who are asking and who are seeking and who are knocking and who desire to know the truth and to do the truth. I pray, Father, this Passover season that you would bless this nation. I pray, Father, that you would bless each and every nation where your children reside, whether that nation be Pakistan or North Korea or China or whatever nation that it might be, Canada, Mexico, wherever, the Philippines. We pray, Father, where your people are, that you would bless them where they are. Bless the house of Israel. We know that it is scattered among the nations, and we also know that it is written that Yeshua, the prophet likened unto Moses, will once again do as Moses did and bringing us all out and creating a greater exodus than we have ever seen or could ever imagine. We know that that day is coming, and we want to be a part of it, and we praise your name for allowing us to have that hope. Give us the tenacity of the Lion of Judah to endure until the end, and to conquer over evil, to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And please, never leave us. Bind us together with unbreakable chains as one. Thank you, everybody. Again, uh, I appreciate you so very, very much. Happy Passover season. Don't forget to do the communion service if you're having Passover. Uh, that's going to be very, very uh, important. Uh, I may try to, uh, I, I don't know if I'll be able to do a live communion service because I will be at a at a live Passover fellowship uh, and we've been having problems with the internet there. So uh, I might try to, to do something on my phone. Uh, I'm not really sure, but tomorrow uh, at twilight, if I can get something up, I'll try to uh, to record that for you so that you can see all of us doing the communion service at twilight. Uh, if not, please, my friends, don't forget to just do it, do it on your own. Do it with your family. Do it with your friends. Do it with whoever's there. If it's just you, just do it. You just do it. But always remember, my friends, our Messiah said uh, to do this in remembrance of him. So the communion service, the bread, the wine. Remember, the, the bread is the body of Yeshua that we take into ourselves, the blood of Yeshua that brings in the new covenant. Uh, do that in remembrance of him. Uh, this Passover season. It's most important this Passover season. Uh, so with that being said, everybody, God bless you. Thank you so very much. And we will see you next time. May the face of Yehovah God shine upon you until we meet again. Shabbat Shalom, everyone.